Good afternoon and welcome to Company Roots. Today we're interviewing Professor Robert Siemens, an Associate Professor of Management and Organizations at NYU Stern. Professor Siemens' research deals with the role of technology in the interactions among firms and how technology and AI can affect the economy. Professor Siemens is also the Director of the Center for the Future of Management at Stern. His work has been published in leading news outlets such as Forbes, New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. It is a privilege to be interviewing you today. My name is Raul Kavuru. I'm a junior at St. Paul School in New Hampshire, where Professor Siemens also attended, and I'm the president of Company Roots. My name is Shrikar Parsi, and I'm a senior at Strawberry Crest High School in Tampa, Florida, and I'm an interviewer and writer for Company Roots. So the first question that we always like to start off with is, what are your company roots, and how do they help you in shaping the ideas and becoming the person that you are today? Um, first of all, let me start by saying uh, thank you both very much for inviting me to take part in this. Um, I was thank very you. excited to get the invitation, to get the email, and I'm excited to be uh, speaking with you both today. Um, so, so yeah, th thank you for, for the question, um, uh, company roots, right? So for starters, I, um, I don't uh, run a company. Uh, I'm, I'm a professor. And so, the, the, you know, so what are the roots that led me to become a professor at a business school? Um, I could spend like an hour telling you about it. I could spend one minute. I'm going to try to give you something in between, but closer to the one minute, if that's okay. So um, after graduating from St. Paul's uh, in 1991, um, I went to Reed College. It's a liberal arts school in Portland, Oregon. Um, I really enjoyed it there. I loved it. Uh, I was an English major. I was doing my dissertation on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Right? You all have heard of Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, one of the characters in the Canterbury Tales is the wife of Bath. Um, as part of, part of the process of doing um, a, a dissertation in English literature is that I had to basically minor in a foreign language. And so I picked Chinese. Um, and as part of that, I did a school year abroad in China. This was 1993 to 1994. Uh, during that time period, China was just uh, really, really rapidly developing, really, really rapidly going from uh, a communist country to let's say like more of a capitalist country. Mm -hmm. um, and I was totally fascinated by it. I mean, during the year that I was there, I could just, I could really see a lot of the changes that capitalism was, um, positive changes that capitalism was having for the country. And it just got me really interested in economics and business and things like that. So when I came back to the US, I was still you know, do, um, an English major, uh, but I took as many economics classes as I could. That led to a short career working in business and then ultimately to, um, to doing a PhD at University of California at Berkeley. Uh, once I graduated from there, that was in 2009, um, I took a job as an assistant professor here at NYU Stern, and I've been here ever since. Awesome. Well, I'm a huge believer in getting a proper and foundational education, as learning is definitely one of the biggest gifts. And on that same note, you were able to receive a BA in English from Reed College, an MBA from Yale, an MA in economics from Boston University and a PhD, as you were saying, of business administration from Berkeley. And so how has that incredible education helped you when uh, making the transition to a professor? Yes, uh, right, so, so, so you, you, you filled in some of the details. I was trying to keep it a little bit shorter, but yes, you're right. I, I didn't go straight uh, to doing the PhD. Um, I worked for a few years in Portland, Oregon for a company that was doing um, basically a little bit of import and export uh, with Hong Kong, China, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, and the US. Um, after a few years doing that, I went to Yale to do an MBA. And my plan at that point was to try to transition into consulting. Um, you know, my thinking was I enjoyed thinking about businesses, but I, I didn't necessarily want to be a general manager or something like that. Um, and I, I went through the process of, um, uh, um, you know, the sort of a recruiting process that one goes through when you're doing your MBA. Um, I, I got a consulting job, but realized that that sort of wasn't quite abstract enough. I, I wanted to get even more abstract. Um, and so talked with um, um, a couple of professors at Yale, uh, one of whom I remain in touch with. Her name is Fiona Scott Morton. And uh, through conversations with those professors decided that probably the best route was to get a PhD and become a research professor. Um, now, as it turns out, th this is now where the English comes back, right? So, so as it turns out, however, um, I didn't have the math background that was necessary in order to apply to and get in a, into a top uh, PhD program in business or, econo or economics. Um, and so I 
enrolled in a master's program in economics at Boston University and took the core classes that I was required to take. And then for all of the electives, I basically took math classes and um, got my math up to speed and then applied to PhD programs. Um, so what's the moral of that story? I'm not sure. You know, it was, it was one of these things where I, I think it took me a while to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. But once I realized what that was, and this was probably circa 2002, 2003, um, I set in, in place um, a set of things that I needed to do in order to reach that goal, right? And so those things involve, you know, uh, basically enrolling in, in, a, in yet another master's degree, um, taking a bunch of math classes, I'll come back to that in a sec, um, and, um, and then figuring out wh where to do a PhD and then spending a bunch of years doing the PhD. Um, you know, th there were sort of two interesting things um, that came out of this. So one was, so let's see, at this point, I was probably in my late 20s, early 30s. Um, I basically had stopped math at St. Paul School, right? When I went uh, to college, I, I didn't uh, take any math classes because I didn't need to as an English major. Uh, so I, I had never had calculus. And so when I first started at Boston University, um, I actually had to take calculus classes over the summer. Uh, it was sort of like a summer session type of thing. And most of the, most of the people taking those classes were high school students that were trying to get ahead and, and get like a leg up on the college classes that they were gonna take. So here I was a, a 30 year old taking math classes with 15 year olds. And it was, you know, and, and I, I was like doing poorly and they like totally got it. And it was one of these things where I, there were a few times where I was really questioning, you know, what, am I really doing the right thing here? Or is this, is this crazy? Cause it really feels like a step back instead of a step forward. Um, and, and maybe it was a little bit of a step back but it was a step back in order order to put to myself forward. on the path that I, yeah, that, that, I, that I knew that I needed to be on. Now, the other thing was, um, um, you know, th then going and doing the master's degree at BU and then the uh, five years in the PhD program at uh, Berkeley, um, that was multiple years of earning very little money. And there was a real opportunity cost to that, right? I mean, you, you uh, pick a figure that you think um, so someone with an MBA should be making per year that they could be doing in consulting, take that away, right? Now, right, or, you know, take that and I'll multiply that by five, let's say. And it's like, th there's that money that you could be earning as your career is progressing and, and you're not, right? Because you're sort of plug still plugging away as a, as a student. So it was this, um, it, it was costly, right? There was a huge opportunity cost. And again, that was another thing that was sort of, uh, in my mind sort of weighing all the time, like, am I really making the right choice here? Um, but I felt like I was, um, and I, I remain happy with the choice. Awesome. Yeah, like you talk about math, but some of the courses that you teach are um, like data-driven decision-making and game theory. And obviously like oh, everything to do with data often involves like math and usually computer mm -hmm. science, right? So, um, like a lot of people say that data is the crude oil of the 21st century, since data um, is just like, you, you can't really do anything with raw data, but when you extract information with it, there's a lot that can come out with it. So why do you think that data is so important in execution? And also how can we teach these techniques to the next generation of business leaders? Um, great question. So, um, so a couple things, so, so first, um, economists like myself like to point out that it's not quite accurate to, to make the analogy between data and oil because once you use up oil, right, when you, let's say, burn it to get energy, you, you can never use it again. Whereas mm -hmm. the data that you use in one algorithm, you, you can use the exact same data in, in another algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, the analogy isn't quite right in, in that sense, right? The, the, the data can be reused. Um, however, I think where the analogy does well is in thinking about uh, oil as a really scarce resource, right? That certain countries have and other countries don't. And that um, uh, arguably, you know, sort of changed the course of world history starting, you know, 1970 or so, right? When you have uh, OPEC, uh, which sort of dictate a lot of what happened in terms of energy policy here in the US. Um, and, and some would argue ultimately the decision on, on the uh, part of the US government to support uh, investments in shale oil uh, exploration and things like that, right? So, um, so, so the, the, this, this scarce commodity had a real impact on the world, okay? 
in a similar way, data, so while data doesn't get used up, right? Data is scarce in, in, in the sense that the companies that have this data are not sort of freely sharing it with a lot of other people. Now there's some perhaps good reasons for that, right? Like the, the, the data might be very personal to me, a customer of that company. And so they, they can't really share it with other people because then maybe they're violating the terms and conditions that they've agreed to with me. But nevertheless, there are some companies, frankly, very large companies, not just tech companies. It, it tends to be tech companies that people will talk about, uh, Google, for example, or Amazon, that have a lot of data about individuals. But it's not just the tech companies, it's also banks, right? Really large banks have just a ton of data, right? When, when you think about, sorry, this is a, just a slight aside, but I think it's really worth pointing out. Um, when you think about the company that I interact with on a regular basis that has the most information, like most sensitive information about me, it's, it's not Google, right? It's not Amazon. It's got to be Chase, right? That, that, that's the bank that I use, right? They know exactly how much money I make each month. They know exact my credit card is through Chase as well. They know exactly what I spend my money on. They know the timing in terms of when I do it. Um, they can see my, you know, sort of the profile of my, I also have my, perhaps not, perhaps not smartly, right? I'm using Chase for everything. They know exactly what my investments are because I have my uh, retirement account through them. Like they, they just have an incredible profile of me that is so much more data rich than Amazon or, or Google. In, in any case, uh, they, JP Morgan Chase, uh, have a lot of data on me. And, and that, that, in a sense, is a scarce resource that some other financial startup doesn't have, right? So a startup, so um, uh, Shrikar, so if you were to start up a credit card company, which might not be a bad idea, right? It might, might be a great idea. You might have a really clever idea about how to come up with a, a new um, credit card that's that would uh, generate a lot of consumer welfare and, and uh, profits for businesses and things like that. But in order to do that and, and get a leg up on that, uh, you're going to need access to my data. But how are you going to get that, right? JP Morgan has all of that. You have none of it, right? And so that that disparity in terms of who has the data, um, I think, has been driving a lot of the interactions between or a lot of the disparities, I guess, between companies. Um, and will we'll probably be like a really big focus of uh, government policy over the next uh, five years, I guess. Yeah, I totally agree. Like you were talking about consulting before too. And that's like another example, because I always thought like, I always thought that consultants were kind of useless because if you're outsourcing a problem to another company that no doesn't know a lot about you, why don't you just do it in-house, right? But when I was like actually talking to consultants, like family, friends, and other people we've interviewed, they were talking about how they have tons of data. They spend millions of dollars every year just on gathering data that helps businesses make decisions. And these businesses just don't have access to the data. That's like the number one differentiator. So I thought that was pretty cool. So, so I, I guess a little side point to that is, um, so companies know that this data is potentially very useful, but they don't often know exactly what it's useful for. Right, so, so they want to hold on to it because they, they, they believe that probably at some point, like all this data will be really useful. Right now, little bits of it are for small things like targeted credit card advertising on interest rates or something like that. But they, they figure at some point, all of this will be really useful, but they don't quite know what yet. And so they're holding on to that, you know, just sort of ho uh, hoarding it basically, right? So there, there's a fair bit of data hoarding going on. Yeah, and definitely I was looking uh, into your, one of your articles about technology and data where you were advocating for Congress to fund this robot census. And uh, I think there yep. <laughs> um, it would gather, the robots would gather data regarding, uh, or no, the census would gather data regarding, you know, the extent on how much a firm can use technology such as AI or robots. And you, you I think you said that um, that would help determine, you know, the technology's impact on a company's metrics such as productivity and sales. And so what do you think we would be able to do in the future if this correlation is proved in the United States. Yeah, um, so, so I think it's, for starters, um, I think it's really important that we as a country uh, have a good understanding about which firms are using which technologies. Uh, we, we don't need to know this, you know, specific things about specific things, but we, we just have to have a, a good sense as to, you know, are uh, financial services firms using this technology, this technology, or this technology. Um, are manufacturing firms using this technology, this technology, this technology. Um, and then with that data, um, you, you'd be able to um, try to figure out what, you know, how much these different technologies contribute to the productivity of those firms and what the effect is on workers. Now, the reason why it's really important to have that information is um, 
it, it would help you to make policy, right? So if you learned that robots are actually, you know, as firms are adopting robots, that that's leading to employment growth in those firms, then um, that has implications for policy, right? You wouldn't want to make it hard for firms to adopt robots, right? Because adopting robots is actually good for employment, potentially mm -hmm. good for wages. Um, and, and so it's a way to try to uh, get information to policymakers. Um, it's also potentially a way to uh, track how our country, how the United States is doing relative to other countries. So other countries routinely co uh, collect information like this. Norway does, for example, Canada does, China does. Um, and, they, and these countries have a good sense about um, how these new technologies are spreading throughout their economy and what the effect is on their economy. Um, I feel like we are at a disadvantage and that we just, we don't have similar types of information. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, another question that um, I was thinking of when I was reading the same article was, um, you talk about robots and when, whenever I think of the introduction of robots into manufacturing sectors specifically, I think that they'll decrease jobs, right? That just like intuitively makes sense for me since robots are gonna replace workers. But in the article, you point out that in Spain, France, Denmark, and Canada, the introduction of robots actually helped increase workers' jobs in, in those, like in the sectors that you mentioned. I don't really remember which ones they were. Like, do you think you could help us like kind of understand why this is the case, why the introduction of robots helped increase jobs? Yeah. Um, so, so again, uh, just so, so you, you, you said it absolutely correctly, but I just, I just want to repeat it because it's, it's uh, so counterintuitive. That I think it's really important that people uh, hear it. Firms that adopt all of the research so far, this is in France, Spain, uh, Canada, China, um, a little bit of early research coming out of, the, out of the US shows that when firms adopt robots, those firms see employment growth, productivity growth, increases in sales and, and, and things like that. Um, so why is that? Um, there could be a few reasons. So one, I, I mean, and, and these are not necessarily like mutually exclusive reasons, right? I mean, it could be sort of multiple reasons of this. Um, one reason could be that the firm that's adopting the robots are just firms that are growing faster to begin with. And so there's a, and, and so that, that's sort of what's driving the correlation. Um, a, another, Another reason is that the firms that are adopting the robots are able to uh, produce now, let's say, like twice as much as they used to in the past. Um, that allows them to produce products at lower cost than before. That then increases demand from the end customer who now wants more. Um, and so they build out extra lines and they're able to hire uh, more workers to work on those lines together with the robots. Now, one of the things that um, I've seen from some work that I've been doing using uh, data out of China, um, other folks that are using data out of Canada, uh, I've seen this in their data, um, is that it's not the same types of workers at those firms, right? So, so when the firm is adopting these robots and sort of expanding their production and things like that, they're actually doing a, a fair bit of shifting in the mix of employment. And it, and it tends to be um, uh, more highly ed educated uh, workers, workers with uh, that, that are more likely to have an undergraduate degree, particularly sort of a technical degree, uh, that, that are being hired at these firms. Mm -hmm. So they're for sure. So it's not. So the story is not just that employment is increasing, but it's also the mix of jobs is changing at these plants. Yeah, that's definitely a great observation. And kind of on that same note of efficiency, in another post you cited with a proposal by Lisa Cook to deliver COVID stimulus checks uh, through services such as Venmo and PayPal. Uh, since it would streamline the process, decreasing costs and time, and also make more people turn towards the online banking. Um, and that's been shown to increase spending in uh, countries like China because there's more access. And so the government actually didn't take this path, did it despite uh, the merits shown? And so why do you think the government decided to act this way? Uh, so why, why the government um, didn't chose? Didn't yeah. so, the, so the government um, in, instead opted to do uh, direct deposits it, where they could, and then to mail checks uh, in, in other cases. Um, so I, I think they did that because they wanted to keep it as simple as possible, right? That, that was the simplest approach, even though it wasn't necessarily the fastest approach. Um, I think there's some, some debate as to whether uh, sending the money the way I was uh, suggesting they do it and the way Lisa Cook was suggesting they do it. Um, it it's not clear how long it would have taken to set up the infrastructure to do that. Uh, whereas the, the infrastructure already was in place to send, uh, you know, 
paper, paper checks and, and do direct uh, deposits. Um, part of our thinking was, um, so, so I, I wrote the article, but it was after, you know, sort of interacting a fair bit with Lisa Cook and talking mm -hmm. with her about um, her ideas on this. Um, so part of our thinking was that, um, you know, it was a real opportunity to actually put this infrastructure in place, right, to try to get uh, as many people as possible um, banked that aren't already banked. Uh, and and that, that seems like it um, what would have been useful, you know, an opportunity. It's an opportunity that uh, didn't end up happening, unfortunately. Got it. But, but fortunately, a whole lot of people got um, stimulus checks. And again, very recently, a, a whole bunch of people got more stimulus checks. Yeah, at least there's an upside to all of that. That's right. Yeah. It, for me, it feels like a trend. I feel like the government takes like the more traditional route, usually just because of the amount of bureaucracy involved, whereas technology would be a step up. Like, as you mentioned, it would increase spending due to like online banking and online transaction just being way simpler. But yeah, it, it just didn't happen. But another thing is like, I think we were talking about the merits of data throughout this entire conversation. And like, as both of us are teenagers and like you're a professor who like teaches data, we, we all know data's potential and we love technology, right? But I feel like in our um, age, technology also has a lot of drawbacks, especially in artificial intelligence, which I think was like one um, aspect of your research. For example, um, Instagram or Facebook's uh, recommendation algorithm on the post that they recommend you see is said to be polarizing since people will watch what they like and when you keep watching what you like, you'll just become more radical. Um, there's this company called Compass, and it indicates that it, it's for prisons, and it indicates that Black people are 20 or two times more likely than their white counterparts to recommit a crime when in reality they're not. Uh, uh, for Google search algorithms, whenever women search up jobs, it's, um, it's less paying than when men of the same socioeconomic status search up the same job. So I think there's like a lot of problems with data ethics, but how do you think we can like mitigate these drawbacks while still keeping technology's potential? Uh, yeah, uh, great question, right? Because of course there's a ton of potential and we don't wanna, we don't wanna say, well, let's not have any of this technology because of the, the downsides. At least, at, at least that, that's my view, right? We wanna sort of embrace the, 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 uh, all the potential that we can get out of this technology while trying to mitigate as much as possible um, the, the downsides. Now, in terms of how to do it, um, there, there's a variety of ways. I mean, so one of them is to try to push firms to do um, more sort of self-regulation around this than they currently do. And for sure, it's the case that some firms are doing more on this than others, right? There, there are some firms that have AI ethics boards and things like that that are in place. Um, the whole purpose of those boards is to sort of audit, if you will, sort of audit what it is that the company is doing. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to AI to try to prevent those types of things from happening. Now, in, so, so in, in practice, uh, so in principle, uh, something like an AI ethics board would be useful and one of the ways to address the downsides that you're highlighting. In practice, it's really hard for the AI ethics boards to do this. Uh, there are famous examples, um, Google in particular, of firms that put in place these AI ethics boards, but then um, uh, don't listen to the recommendations from the ethicists or, or at least you know, the members of those AI ethics boards. And in fact, in Google's case, uh, Google has uh, basically completely disbanded its mm -hmm. AI ethics board. Um, so, so, you know, that, that, that's one possible approach. Um, re regulation maybe would be another uh, possible approach. Uh, clarity around what can be litigated so people could actually sue um, for this. Um, would be one way that would, frankly, like really quickly get firms to uh, stay focused on this. Um, and and there the, the probably, you know, I, the, the, there probably are other ways as well. Um, in terms of what, what might be the most, most promising, I would imagine some type of regulation coupled with the ability to litigate uh, would probably be really effective. And then what you would see happen, and, and you're already starting to see this a little bit, is a whole bunch of firms um, I bet would sort of enter the space who offer services to large companies to sort of audit, do, do like sort of algorithmic audits of the existing AI and, and the new AI that these uh, firms come up with. Right. You know, in, in the same way that we have, um, you know, Moody's, for example, that gives bond ratings 
and things like that. You can imagine something like that, that sort of goes around and does like a rating service for, um, for uh, AI and, and those types of algorithms. What are your thoughts about like mandating on like near transparency? For example, Signal, it's a messaging platform and yeah. this code is open source. So like if someone were to take the time and knew the information necessary, they could see exactly where our data was being sent. So like, what do you think about legislation that almost mandates this? Uh, what, what do you mean almost mans it, mandates it? So, so, so it's not like complete transparency, but- Yeah, like for into technology, for example, that's not accessible yeah. out, um, like outside of their company. I think that should stay secret since if that wasn't, right. if that wasn't, if that was transparent, then anyone could just recreate a company, right? Could copy it, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, so that, that's the tricky thing. And, and frankly, it was a tricky thing that Microsoft was faced with back in the uh, 90s when they were being sued for being a, a monopoly. Uh, there was some question as to whether they should reveal the source code to, um, uh, to their operating system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so I, think, I think you wanna be careful to protect the intellectual property that the, uh, that the companies have while trying to bring more transparency. Um, now, how, how to do that um, so, so one of the things that I, that I think will happen is there'll be sort of a new, new occupational class that'll be something like an algorithmic explainer, is sort of the way I've been calling it. You know, so, so it's a new job and the, it's someone who has good computer science training, but also good sort of presentation skills and good sort of translations or verbal translation skills. And um, I, I would imagine that what their role is, is they sort of understand what it is that the AI is doing, what the algorithm is doing, and they can sort of turn around and, and, and in very plain language sort of describe that to a broader public. Um, and, and I could imagine a role like that being a fairly important role at uh, technology companies going forward. Yeah, I know. Like, like, yeah. Um, I know. I, or what I was gonna, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, so like, I think one of the main things is like, we, we don't understand what, what's going on in these algorithms. For example, in neural networks, um, the, the uh, beginning layers and the end layer, we totally understand it's just the inputs and the outputs, but the middle layers, no, like no computer scientists right now understand what's happening. And there's a lot of research being done about exactly what's happening during these deep layers, I guess. So I think like having a job like that would be super useful once people start understanding the biases that are inbuilt into these algorithms without us consciously understanding them yet. I don't know if you watched a, a great documentary called like the social dilemma it, it like on Netflix it outlined a lot of the problems with technology but like you know the trickiness and because a lot of the companies are for profit driven and it's pretty tricky to you know try to be ethical since they're gonna also reduce the profits that they make yeah um, I, I have not I, it's it's on my uh, to watch list and I'm ashamed to admit that uh, I haven't watched it yet I will um, yeah, I, so, so, so again, we talk, so let, let's, but let, 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 let's come to that. Let's talk about ethics just for a sec. And, and this idea that I gave you about like the AI explainer. Um, I, it, it's tricky, right? Um, you know, just like these AI ethics boards, right? If, you know, if the company doesn't like what the, the way the AI explainer is explaining what's happening, then that in, individual can, can be fired, right? And moreover, the, the individual knows that and so they may that that may affect the way that they explain what it is that the algorithm does. Yeah. Um, so so you could imagine there being uh, maybe like professional associations, uh, just like there are for accountants, uh, just like there are for lawyers. It, it doesn't fix everything, but it sort of is a way to try to um, protect those individuals a little bit more, give them a code of conduct, and and, and things like that. Yeah, and again, I, I expect all of that sort of infrastructure that you might associate with like being a lawyer or an accountant, there'll be a lot of that that gets built up around um, AI, like sort of the space of like AI ethics and sort of explainable AI and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and kind of on the note of like, you know, being ethical, being like social good, I think it's definitely amazing to be able to incorporate one's passion when trying to make an impact and try, trying to make a change in community. And so in 2015, you've had the honor of serving as a senior economist for the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House. And so can you describe that experience and some of the crucial decisions and critical decisions you were able to make? 
Um, yeah, it was, um, I, I remain incredibly grateful for the opportunity that I had to do that. Um, I, I took a leave of absence from NYU and, and um, the family and I moved down to the DC area for, for a year. Um, and I served on the Council of Economic Advisors. So first, uh, just stepping back from it, so what is it that CEA does? There's sort of two roles that CEA fulfills. Uh, one of them is to um, advise other, so, so Council of Economic Advisors doesn't have any policymaking role per se, right? There are other policymaking bodies within the White House. That would be, for example, the National Economic Council or the Domestic Policy Council or the Office of Science and Technology Policy, just to name a few. Um, so, so those bodies sort of generate policy uh, that eventually get approved or not approved by the president. Um, and one of the roles of the Council of Economic Advisors is to advise on the underlying economics of some of the policy ideas that come out, right? So some of them are great ideas and um, we, we sort of tell the people who have come up with them that they're great ideas. Uh, other ideas are not that great and we sort of explain why and in some cases try to make suggestions for how the policy uh, could be shifted uh, to be better. Um, so that's sort of one of the functions of uh, CEA. And then the other function is to um, do a little bit of research on th things that are happening, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of things of interest that are sort of um, uh, in the news. And so in my case, I was the senior economist for technology and innovation. And we've been talking about robots and, a and AI, right? O over the course of this conversation, that was something that was really starting to uh, heat up. And there was a lot of discussion around that at the time. Um, and so part of my role was to try to assemble what we knew about these technologies and to try to think through what the effects on the economy would be at sort of a macro level, uh, as well as a little bit more granularly in terms of what some of the effects would be on labor. Um, and so, and so uh, that, that was a ton of fun to do. And then for me personally, um, it was great because um, it, it came at sort of the right time in my career where I was sort of had sort of uh, finished working on one trajectory of, of my research and was um, starting to look for another um, trajectory for my research. And so it's uh, dating back to that point where I started really focusing all the research that I continue to this day on robots and AI. So we have one final question. Um, for example, I, I really want to go into data analytics, um, something to do with computer science and hopefully entrepreneurship uh, rolling around data ethics. So, and you as a professor yourself, what advice would you give to the current generation of students that would like to make a positive impact on society? And how would you recommend that they can start the process maybe even like today? I, a, a few things. So, so for starters, like think about what it is that you really enjoy doing. Don't, don't worry about like what the different career paths are out there. I mean, it, it's good to be aware of them, right? We don't want, you know, we, we do live in a world, not in sort of silos, right? Um, so think about the career paths that are out there, but, but don't worry too much about them. If one of those seems like it's like really what you want to do. Like, for example, if you really want to do investment banking, um, th there's a really specific career path associated with that. And you can sort of, you know, figure out what it is you need to do to sort of line yourself up for that. Um, so, so be aware of those, but don't let those constrain what it is that you do. Think about the things that you really enjoy doing and like doing and explore that a little bit, right? I mean, this is maybe getting a little philosophical, but my belief is I have this one life to live. Uh, you, you, you may or may not believe that, but um, so, so take, you know, take time to sort of explore stuff a little bit because you're, you're never going to have another opportunity, right? You don't get a do-over. So explore stuff a little bit. Um, get a sense of what you enjoy doing, what you like doing. Don't worry about making mistakes. It's okay. Everybody makes mistakes um, while you're doing this exploration process. Um, and then um, once you have a good sense of what it is you want to do, then, you know, forge forward. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. In terms of specific stuff around data that, that you brought up and, and analytics, um, I would, you know, th there's, there are lots and lots of online courses right now that can teach you some of the, the real basics around manipulating data and sort of different programs and things like that, like Python, for example. Um, I would invest some time in taking those classes and just sort of play around with, with those um, programs. Um, see if you can find some sort of a internship, uh, you know, summer internship maybe or something like that, um, where you can put some of those uh, tools to use. 
in a business environment. And so that, that would give you, or it could be at a business, it could be at a nonprofit, but, but you know, sort of like a real world uh, environment. It'll give you a sense about how those different tools get used. And it might give you some interesting ideas for um, maybe a business of your own that you might be able to start up. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for letting us interview. It was an honor and a privilege hearing your story.